Hello, folks. I am Trevor Welsh, and I thank you for tuning in to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Fort Worth District's podcast, Life is Better at the Lake, the only podcast that brings you all the greatness and splendor of our 25 lakes across the great state of Texas. As always, this podcast is made possible by the U.S. Armed Forces Service members, whose bravery and sacrifice allow you to listen to this and other great podcasts whenever, wherever, and however you want. To get the full effect, you can watch my guest and I interact on the YouTube version of this podcast. But if you're in a car, or at the gym, or you just don't like seeing my face, subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts so you'll be notified when each monthly episode is published. Details will be in the description. Also, feel free to send comments to public.affairs at usace.army.mil. Now, sit back and get ready to learn why life is better at the lake. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Life is Better at the Lake. I'm Trevor Welsh, and I'm here at Canyon Lake with Ranger Philip Anderson. Phil, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you for having me. We are going to get started here in just a second, but before we get started, I want to remind the viewers and listeners that you can find this podcast on Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. All right, let's get started, Phil. Phil, tell me about your background and... um, where are you, who you are, where are you from, uh, okay. where'd you grow up, what kind of music do you listen to, tell me everything. I am all the way from Austin, Texas, USA. I was born and raised in the city, but I'm as country as it gets from being from the city, Okay, if that makes that does any make sense. sense at all. Yeah, you're a uh, concrete cowboy. Oh, there you go, like uh, John Travolta, I There you guess. go. <laughs> But I like doing the the two step, and I like listening to country music. I like being outdoors, hunting and fishing, and so here I am as a park ranger, getting to enjoy all of those things and get paid to do it. Kind of nice. Yeah, that is nice. Tell me about. Uh, I saw a, a couple of degrees on your wall. What'd you go to school for? I was in school for a long, long time. <laughs> so. I would imagine that I'm not that much different than most folks out there. I didn't have a clue what I wanted to be whenever I was whenever I was in college. I guess I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be <laughs> when I grow up. But I went to school at Texas State University in San Marcos, and I got my undergraduate degree in let's see geography and Espanol. Yeah. So you, you so your minor is in ge- is in Spanish. I had two majors, geography and Spanish. Double major. Double Look at major. this guy. <laughs> and I had a minor in nature and heritage tourism. Wow. Yeah, I just fell into all of those. There's no rhyme or reason why. Well, I guess I um, you know, I spoke a, a, quite a bit of Spanish getting into college, and so while I was figuring everything out, uh, I was able to place out of the first like four semesters of of Spanish. Uh, when I was in high school. And so I figured, well, let me just take a few more Spanish classes. I'll knock that major out and then figure out something else to do from there. Cool. Very cool. So you obviously have a degree that relates to this sort of profession, but after you got your degree, how did you come to be a ranger? So when I was a junior in college, I remember I was in one of my geography classes because I had declared geography as my second major. And so I was always the one in class, for those of y'all that know me, you'll understand, that asked a million questions. I was that guy that most people hated because they wanted to get out of class early, but I would sit there and ask question after question. We never got out of class early any class that I was in. I left class one day and I was approached by an older woman that sat in the back of the class. And she said, Philip, by the questions that I hear you asking, I think you'd be a good fit for a summer park ranger out at Canyon Lake. And I knew where Canyon Lake was. You know, I went to school in San Marcos. Canyon Lake's about half an hour west of San Marcos. And, you know, I just never knew that there was an opportunity to be a park ranger, yet alone with the Army Corps of Engineers. And she told me that she was a student park ranger herself and that in the summertime, the Corps, you know, hired college students to assist with the, the high, you know, visitation during the summer months. So I, 
I applied, I sent in my resume to the lake manager and I got hired. I'm pretty sure I got hired by default because <laughs> nobody else knew that there were job opportunities for college kids out here. So here I am, you know, 13 years later, that was, uh, you know, May of 2007 that I started. Wow. And after working my first summer, I, I realized that, you know, hey, I like this. And it's just a natural fit for, you know, my personal interests. And so I got hired on again for my senior year in 2008 as a summer ranger. And I was allowed to stay on year round after that as a uh, year round stay in school, you know, park ranger. Very cool. Well, now that we know about you, let's talk about the lake. Sounds good. Tell me a little bit about the history of, of the lake and, uh, and why it exists. The lake was, uh, was built starting back in 1958. Of course, you know, the paperwork, it was in the, the, the plans for many years before that, at least 10 years before that, uh, it was authorized. But construction began in 1958, and it was six years of it. It uh, completed in 1964. And then once they started impounding water, once the Corps started impounding water, it took four years for it to fill up. So in 1968, it reached conservation pool, 909 feet above mean sea level. And it was uh, constructed for two primary reasons, just like most core lakes in the Fort Worth district. Uh, main reason was uh, flood control. I guess now we call it flood risk management, you know, semantics, uh, and water conservation. And then, you know, environmental stewardship and recreation were kind of secondary, you know, purposes of the lake being constructed. So tell me, uh, you guys, it's an earthen embankment dam. It is. It's uh, a little less than a mile long. How many miles of shoreline do you have? 82 miles of shoreline, and there's about 8,000 surface acres of water. Uh, it stores 325,000 cubic feet, or excuse me acre feet of water. Okay. And to put that in perspective, the average family of four consumes about one acre of water per year. So if wow. you take a city you know, the size of San Antonio, uh, basically if, if we never received a drop of rain and San Antonio decided to use all their water from Canyon Lake, it could support the city of San Antonio for one year. Oh, wow. That's kind of how I put it in perspective. This lake is a little bit different um, because it's not necessarily, it's in, it's in a rural environment, but to talk about where we are in Texas. So Canyon Lake is pretty much centrally located in between Austin and San Antonio, maybe a little bit closer to San Antonio. And it's about, you know, 20 minutes west of I-35. So there's about 4 million people living within an hour's drive of the lake. And there aren't that many other options of, you know, lakes to visit in this area. You know, we're in South Central Texas. It's, it's pretty dry. And then, you know, you've got this beautiful limestone uh, bottom lake that creates this, this blue water like no other. And so we have a very, very, I call it a dense recreation, uh, I guess, pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, there are very few water access points. Most of the shoreline access around the lake is, you know, you know private property. So Or cliffs. Or, or cliffs, yeah, yeah, very, very rugged. So you've got a whole lot of people trying to access just a small, you know, amount of space. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the lake manager, Javier, and he said, I don't, you, you might remember the number or know the number, uh, rather, uh, how many private properties, houses are around the lake, like on the on the shoreline. I know that Terry Beth, one of our park rangers here, she knows this number off the top of her head, but I think it's, I know it's over a thousand. Um, I think it's right around 1100. 1100 properties on 89 miles of shoreline. 82 miles of 82, shoreline. Uh, sorry, 82 miles of shoreline. So yeah, uh, Phil took me out on the lake, uh, took a, went out on the boat yesterday and yeah, the houses are, a sight to behold, but they are right next to each other and they cover the entire perimeter of the lake. Pretty uh, scrunched in there together. Talk about uh, some of the issues that you have with those people that uh, own property uh, along the shoreline. So you saw just yesterday out there on the water where one landowner clearly built, you know, these 
illegal steps on core property. The next door neighbor then went behind him and built another even more grandiose uh-huh. illegal stairway down to the water. Yep. And then you pointed out that and got my attention, there was a third one yep. being constructed as we were driving by it that was bigger than the first two uh, yet. Elaborate, ornate. <laughs> yes. $100,000 project. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You talked about uh, manpower. Tell me a little bit about the team that you have here at the lake office. We have the Mighty Seven here. <laughs> so we have our lake manager, uh, Javier, Javier Perez Ortiz, and we have a lead ranger, Terry Beth Teschner. We have three park rangers, uh, myself, Garland Ireland, Sam Price, and we have an admin, Jim Camalachi. Um, so you showed me, you took me around, uh, the first day that I got here, took me around on the side by side and showed me a little bit of the, the back country of the lake, the, the stuff that's not necessarily accessible to the public. <clears throat> Talk about the gorge and the, uh, the spillway and the interesting things that you can see out there. Well, we touched on the history of Canyon Lake a little bit earlier in the podcast and the gorge and the spillway is the most significant historical event that the lake has experienced. Back in the year 2002, Canyon Lake experienced the flood of record. It was uh, late June, June 30th is when the rain started to fall and it just kept raining and raining and raining for basically a week straight. And on July 4th, the water rose so high that it went over the spillway. So the lake level normally, the conservation pool, is 909 feet. The spillway is at 943. So the water came up 34 feet. And you were out there on the spillway with me, you know, looking out into the water. And you gave gave you some perspective on how high that water rose. So, yeah, it was like uh, the water's around – it's like two feet below normal pool right now, right? Correct. And it's, what, 30 feet from the top of the spillway down to the – So right now it's – a Lake level is at 907 and spillway is at 943. So it's 36 feet 36 below. 36 feet below the, the, the very top of the spillway. Correct. And when it flooded, it would have been above my head if I was Correct. standing on the spillway. So it didn't just trickle over the spillway. It, uh, it went over the spillway by seven feet. Yeah. And you're a large guy, you know, <laughs> six foot seven. But yeah. You'd be looking, you know, you'd be completely submerged in yeah. that water. And, uh, what I, I guess, whenever I go to schools and present present it to them, now 2002, no one was alive. None of the kids were alive yeah. to understand how much water that was. But we did have a relatively recent rainmaking event here in Texas that had a similar amount of water. You know, in our drainage basin during 2002, you know, the area experienced anywhere from 30 to 50 inches of rain. Because we had so much water, because the lake spilled at such a high volume, we had 66,000 cubic feet per second of water going over our spillway. Very powerful. It carved out in its wake this beautiful gorge that we went and took a look at. You know, it's still got water flowing through it. And you'll see, uh, uh, if you're watching this podcast, at the end of the podcast, you'll see a little bit of footage. Uh, I'll put a little bit of footage from that gorge in there. It's It's... Gorgeous. (laughs) Gorgeous. <laughs> and so that, you know, presents another recreational opportunity. So access to the gorge is limited to guided tours only. So, you know, every Saturday, every Sunday, we get folks, you know, coming out here at nine o'clock in the morning to go do the guided gorge tour. And something very interesting happened when that uh, gorge was carved out. It exposed some dinosaur tracks, a couple different sets of them. Uh, and whenever you see the dinosaur tracks and realize how far those footprints are away from one another, gives you an idea of how big those critters were. Yeah, it's <laughs> that dinosaur had to be huge. I mean, it's a dinosaur. I mean, dinosaurs were big, but I I tried taking those steps in stride, and uh, like he said, I'm a big person, and it was way bigger than my stride. And there was there's like six or seven of the, uh-huh. and you can clearly see you can clearly see it's like a a three toed footprint, triangular shape, three-toed footprint. It's pretty, I mean, I thought it was fascinating. So according to, to Marcus, I remember this now, the type of dinosaur is an acrocanthosaurus. Very good memory. <laughs> and it's 13 feet tall. Awesome. Yeah, man, this lake is pretty, uh, it's pretty unique. It's pretty unique. Tell me, uh, 
Tell me a little bit about some past and present partnerships that you had that really benefit the lake and um, the lake's mission. Okay, so we have a couple of partnerships going on right now. There is the, I guess, most recent partnership that we entered with the Water-Oriented Recreation District of Comal County. WORD is their acronym for for short. Mm -hmm. And they have taken over Comal Park. We signed a lease with them back in March, so right before this recreation season began, just in the nick of time for us, or we would have been completely overwhelmed. I mean, mm-hmm. We already were over, are overwhelmed, but uh, they now operate and manage Comal Park for us. So this is our second park that we have turned over to another, uh, to another agency many years ago. I think it was, see, I was here in 2007, and the other park is Jacobs Creek Park. That had been leased out to Joint Base San Antonio prior to my arrival here. I believe it was around the year 2004 that we turned that park over to uh, the military base. So we have two of our parks now that have been leased out, and we have uh, another nonprofit organization that was formed a couple of years ago called the Dam Community Alliance, the DCA for short. And you asked me about that gatehouse that was Mm -hmm. sitting behind our compound. Mm -hmm. So we recently moved an old gatehouse uh, that was inside of our compound to the outside of the compound to allow the Dam Community Alliance to store their um, their stuff. And what they're here for is, I guess, to just, um, well, they were formed back when the dam was shut down a couple years ago because it was not in compliance with the Architectural Barriers Act. And so they, you know, were able to kind of organize the community and raise funds to get the dam reopened. And now it's reopened. But they already became organized. You know, they got their nonprofit status, and so that it didn't simply disband once a dam became open. Mm-hmm. Now they're, you know, trying to, you know, go year round raising money to improve our facilities around here. They've got a lot of, you know, grandiose ideas. I'm not privy to all the ins and outs, but that's another partnership that we have going on right now. So you've got three of them I can name off the top of my head. You know, Word of Comal County. Joint Base San Antonio, the Dam Community Alliance, and of course our original partner, the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. Mm-hmm. You know, when the dam was uh, was authorized, it was, you know, for flood control and water conservation. So, um, whenever the lake is at conservation pool or below, the GBRA, Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, they determine what the outflow is from the dam. Oh, okay. That's their call. Okay. And whenever we're in flood pools, so whenever we go above 909, and sometimes they'll let it, you know, go up to 910, 911, if, you know, we're not facing a, a major crisis. Uh, but anyway, once we go into flood pool, the Corps of Engineers, we start calling the shots. Lake Control up in, up in Fort Worth, they, they make the determination on how much water we should release. And it's like that for, I'm assuming, all of the, the lakes, the core lakes Mm -hmm. in the Fort Worth district. Okay. So that's an ongoing partnership and, and the original one right there. Very cool. Phil, tell me about the recreation on Canyon Lake. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to do out here. It's, uh, just an overall very visually appealing place to be. And the lake is, is so deep. I mean, the water is, is nice and cool as well, especially if you're on the other side of the dam floating the river, you know, where the water comes out, at uh, the bottom of the lake, it's a really, really nice place to cool off in the miserable heat that we're experiencing now. But that's yeah. what makes it so popular. So we have 23 boat ramps on the lake, um, that, a lot of water access points. However, there's so many people trying to, you know, come out to the lake that no matter where you end up to access the water, it's going to be completely out of control. Mm-hmm. I'd recommend coming out here on the weekdays. It's a little bit better. Sometimes you still fill up on weekdays. But, uh, yeah, it's just naturally beautiful out here in the Texas Hill Country. You know, you've got rolling hills all surrounding the lake. You know, it's uh, very close by to some great nightlife in New Braunfels, you know, San Marcos. Of course, 6th Street in Austin is not too far away. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, most people come out here just to fish, to swim, to go boating. You know, there's a couple of marinas out here and there's a whole lot of houses. There is a correction to my data from earlier in the podcast. I just spoke with uh, Ranger Teshner and she let me know there's 2,300 
adjacent lot to the lake, not 1100. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And the, any holiday weekend, you know, a lot of these folks that have property out here, they own this, their property as a weekend house mm -hmm. or a, a holiday weekend house, especially. And so the population just swells out of control on weekends, especially holiday weekends, because everybody that has their weekend getaway is at their weekend getaway. And right. it's not just them, it's all of their family as well. I would imagine that with uh, the number of properties surrounding the lake, that there's probably little to no hunting. That is correct. So as far as hunting opportunities out here, that is extremely, extremely limited. We do offer some hunting during deer season, which is November and December, to uh, special interest groups like disabled veterans okay. or local first responders. But it's certainly not open to the public because of what you just mentioned. There's just no land. I mean, right. the conservation pool is at 909, and the federal boundary line is roughly at 918 all the way around the lake. And then the flow easement line is 948. So you're only talking about less than 40 feet of vertical clearance from the lake itself mm -hmm. to where these people's houses are. Right. There are very few hunting opportunities around here, but it's compensated for with your boating, your swimming, your fishing, your, you know, just sun tanning out there, whatever, yep. trail hiking, you know, whatever you, whatever else you want to do or can think of camping, you know, it's, it's to the maximum extent possible. Yep. So tell me about the parks that you uh, the parks that you manage and the parks that you lease out. The dam office is located at Overlook Park. That's our single busiest. I won't even call it a day use park because it's not. But people are using it as a day use park. It's meant to be a scenic viewing area, mm -hmm. but it is the single most popular spot on the lake. And if you ever have come to you know the the dam, you'll understand why. It's perched, you know, high above the lake itself. You can see the entire lake. You can see the hill country around it. You can see the river. You can see all the houses. It's just the most iconic place to be at the lake. Yeah, it is very scenic. It's beautiful. The the uh, the sunset that you saw at the beginning of the podcast, that was from atop the dam yesterday. Uh, yeah, beautiful out there. Amazing. And because of that, it's our busiest place. And oh, by the way, it's free, which just yeah. compounds <laughs> the problems in trying to manage it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, we used to have two designated day use parks, actually three, if you want to go all the way back to when we still managed Jacobs Creek Park back in the you know, early 2000s and, and before that. Uh, but since then, you know, we've leased out Jacobs Creek Park to Joint Base San Antonio. We just recently leased out Comal Park to the Water Oriented Recreation District of Comal County. So we still operate and maintain Canyon Park Swim Beach. That's our only uh, day use park that we still have. We have a couple of campgrounds. Uh, we have Potter's Creek Park and we have Cranes Mill Park. Those are our Class A campgrounds where you can bring your RVs out. Or you know, if you have a tent, we have uh, quite a few tent sites over in Cranes Mill with water and electricity hookups and hot showers. You know, they're very popular year-round. Um, we have a couple of primitive campgrounds. They're closed right now due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we've had to shut down Canyon Park and North Park, our two primitive campgrounds, you know, until... Um, until this pandemic threat goes away. Whereas so, the other, the other, the Class A campgrounds you're talking about, those reservations are made uh, via online transaction with Recreation.gov. Correct. Yeah. So there, we went to reservation only, and there are no, you know, walk-ins anymore. Uh, you, you can't make your reservation at the gatehouse if you come with no reservation, and there happens to be an opening in the park. The gate attendant will instruct, you know, the prospective camper to go on their phone and make a reservation on the recreation.gov. Right. That way there is no money being transmitted from, you know, the, the guest to our gate attendant. Yeah. No person to person contact. That's, I mean, that makes sense. That's great that uh, you guys are doing that. I think the rest of the parks are doing something very similar. Um, along with recreation, since most of the recreation out here has to deal with um, being on the water or near the water, um, minus the limited hunting and the, the trails, uh, we definitely need to talk about water safety and why Certainly. it's, why it's so important. So, 
um, we were out on the boat and I was, I was very happy to see there was a person out there paddle boarding and she had her life jacket on, uh, which you're required to have a life jacket if you're going to be using any sort of craft, whether it be a kayak or, or paddle board or boat or anything, jet ski, uh, what, what have you, you're required to have that. Uh, what else are you required to have on a boat? You're required to have a fire extinguisher and a sound producing device. Also, you have to have a throwable, mm -hmm. some sort of you know boat cushion, as long as it's authorized as a throwable, you know, uh, flotation device. Those are the, the the big ones. You know, life jackets, fire extinguishers, sound producing advice, and a throwable. I know the Coast Guard Auxiliary; they have a list of probably eighty different things that they search for when they do their uh, vessel safety exams. But whenever I ride around with the game wardens. You know, I get a pretty good idea of what they're looking for, and I try to mimic, you know, what, what they do. That way, the public gets a consistent message, whether it's from us or Parks and Wildlife, you know, what they're required to have. Because the last thing I want to do is do a vessel safety check and say, yep, you're good to go. You've got all your required safety equipment. And then they get out there, they get checked by Parks and Wildlife, and they get issued a citation for not having something. Right. And that makes us look bad, and vice versa. You know, I don't want uh, the Parks and Wildlife you know, to check a vessel and then, you know, I catch them as they come in off the water and tell them that they're not in compliance. Right. No, that makes sense. Tell me, um, have you guys had any problems with invasive species out here? Uh, we have, we have zebra mussels. Um, that's rel relatively new. I think it's about four or five years now that we've known we were infested with zebra mussels and something new this year. In fact, there was just an article by Clay Church that came out a couple of days ago about uh, hydrilla and giant sal salvinia. I'm not even sure how to yep. say it. I know salvinia. The, those yep. folks out there at Sam Rayburn, they deal with it all the time. Yeah, They're definitely. probably making fun of me right now. I'm struggling <laughs> how to pronounce it. But uh, uh, yeah, I guess I guess we have hydrilla up in the, like the where the river comes in to the lake at. I know I've seen a lot of floating aquatic life at, by the Cranes Mill Fishing Pier where the river meets the lake. Well, what's the number one thing that uh, boaters can do uh, to manage the spread of invasive species? Clean, drain, and dry. That's what Texas Parks and Wildlife is promoting heavily right mm -hmm. now. And we've got all those uh, zebra mussels and clean, drain, and dry your boats uh, stenciled on our boat ramps at the lake. That way it's right there in your face whenever you're launching or recovering your boat. So basically, if you go out in the lake, you know, a lot of these boats have these, uh, I guess, bilges inside of them. Mm -hmm. And the larvae for the zebra mussels can live in there for many, many days. Oh, wow. And so if these uh, boaters aren't draining their boats and they, you know, go from one lake to another, you know, in a short period of time, then they're spreading the zebra mussel larvae you know, from one lake to another. Right. And we'll have some uh, links to resources from Texas Parks and Wildlife about the Clean Drain and Dry campaign and about how uh, uh, zebra mussels are very, uh, they spread very quickly and they do uh, damage to the natural resources uh, around the lake. <clears throat> Going back to water safety for just a moment, mm -hmm. I don't want to leave that topic without talking about something that... Um, a lot of people don't recognize as a water safety hazard, but I see it over and over. Unfortunately, I see it over and over out here at the lake, and that's the the wind. Uh, a lot of folks come out here; they're good swimmers. They think they're good swimmers. You know, they uh, they just have a lot of confidence, and they'll let's say, for example, to throw in a football to each other in the water, mm -hmm. or they'll have some sort of inflatable tube. Well, on a windy day, you know, if, if you let go of that and it starts drifting out into the water, a lot of people assume they can just go swim out there and, and recover it. Well, that's how a lot of our drownings happen. Okay. You know, people underestimate the power of the wind. You know, they start swimming with the wind current to try to retrieve whatever floating device has drifted away from them. And then once they realize, oh, it's drifting away faster than what I'm swimming towards it, let me turn around and go back. Well, now they're turning around trying to swim into the wind. Yeah. 
and they're exhausted. And we've had quite a few drownings because of that right there. So, I mean, it can happen in just a split second. So I would encourage anybody that's listening in or watching to think about that next time they're out there at a pool or at a lake. And maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody else that you witness out there trying to swim after something that's floated away, something that might cost $5 at the store. They're mm -hmm. risking their life to try to save it. Not worth it. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you went back to water safety because another fact, another thing that you factor in that can amplify any of that that you just talked about is alcohol. There's a, a organization, Operation Dry Water, uh, which I mean, it sounds kind of like a funny name, but it's basically don't don't booze and cruise, don't don't mix alcohol and boating, don't mix alcohol and water recreation. Period. And I'm sure that you can attest to some of the uh, reasons why you wouldn't do that. People come out here and make poor decisions, and a lot of it's influenced by alcohol. And so, you know, if everyone came out here and recreated responsibly, there'd be no need to have park rangers in the parks. And so, the fact that I'm still employed. You know, I'm glad that I'm employed, but at the same time, you know, if people just made better decisions and were responsible and just thought for a moment about what they're about to do before they go and do it, mm -hmm. you know, most of this stuff could be prevented. Right. Speaking of that, tell me some of the issues that you've been having uh, with recreators uh on, on the uh, topic of responsible recreation, talk about some of the issues that you've been having, specifically here at Overlook Park. Okay, yeah, this uh, this year, this year has been tough. So I don't know how to explain it other than it's just been a complete and utter catastrophe. Like, just completely overwhelmed with the visitation. And, you know, in the face of a pandemic where we're encouraging people to observe social distancing, they are denser than ever out here at these parks. And, you know, me being a park ranger, I might not be on the front line, you know, of a hospital seeing, you know, confirmed positive COVID patients, but I'm certainly on the front line of where it's being transmitted from person to person. And it's tough. It's scary. Like this year, I have probably been, along with my coworkers, the most hated man in Comal County from trying to prevent people from coming into the park. And it's not like I'm preventing them from coming into an empty park. I'm preventing them from coming into a park that's already completely out of control. Yep. And they're still trying to get in. Yep. So as far as responsible recreation, it starts right there. Exactly. Just too many people trying to come into our parks. And there's, you know, very little that, that we can do to adequately, adequately control that. You know, the public, they certainly aren't, aren't doing their part in maintaining social distancing whatsoever. And so because of that, now we're experiencing a lot of other problems due to the overcrowding in the parks. You know, Overlook Park, as I alluded to earlier, was designed to be a scenic viewing area, not a day use park. It's a place where you come, you get out of your car, you take a couple pictures, you stretch your legs, you get back in your car and you go. You're in here and you're in and out in you know, 20, 30 minutes. Not anymore. Uh, people here are now coming early in the morning they're inviting all of their family and extended family, and they're staying all day long. Mm -hmm. And the park holds about 60 cars. There are about 60 designated parking spaces. And this summer, you know, we've been getting to a point of having 200 to 250 cars in here, you know, before we shut it down. So you're talking about a park that's three to four and even beyond times what it's designed to hold. Mm hmm and, and all those cars, those that overcrowding of cars creates a hazard, a traffic hazard, but also um, limits the ability for emergency personnel to adequately access the park if they need to. Absolutely. So these people are in, endangering, potentially endangering themselves because if one of them were to get hurt and we can't get a fire truck through here to, to come to their assistance, well, that's a major problem. Mm -hmm. 
And earlier this summer, it was on the same day, you know, the Overlook Park got so crowded that it became a safety hazard to get emergency personnel inside of the park. So I shut it down. You know, I closed it down at the entrance point where people come off the South Access Road and try to enter the park. And that becomes a very hazardous point right there because you have people coming from two directions. You know, they're coming in at 45 miles an hour and they realize the park is closed. So some people are trying to go in the park. They stop. Other people that aren't trying to go in the park, you know, they don't see them stopping and it becomes hazardous. So I remember one day I witnessed a T-bone accident because, you know, people were making very quick decisions right there on the the road. Mm -hmm. And then so I decided to open the park back up because it was such a hazard to close it down. While I opened it back up, the park filled back up again. And then we had a pedestrian get struck inside of the park because it was too constricted on the, the park road. And so what do you do? Like, what's the solution? Now, we're still trying to figure that out. Yeah. You know, we have some ideas here at the project, especially since we're the ones sitting down there, you know, shutting the park down. We have all kinds of time to think, how can we do this better? Uh, after a lot of time to think and reflect, it's a, basically a, a three-part system that we can implement here at Overlook Park to try to, you know, maintain control and keep it you know, safe for both the visitors and for us as the employees. And the first and most important thing that needs to be done is to put physical barriers up along the road edges Mm -hmm. that forces the public to park only in those 60 designated spots. So my personal preference is these, you know, five foot long, two foot high limestone blocks that, you know, they mine just from all the ground that's around us here. They're pretty abundant. (laughs) Yeah. They're pretty easy to get. (laughs) It's very cheap. And they're, you know, they they look pretty good as well. Yep. Um, And that'll certainly prevent cars from, you know, parking on the side of the road. And in addition to that, if we reconfigure the entranceway to the park to where whenever it fills up, whenever it's at capacity, we have an outbound only lane with spike strips going across basically like all of our other parks are configured around here. Yeah. We shut the main gates and then we open up the exit only gate right. to where we don't have to sit there in direct traffic and cause a hazard down there at the bottom of the hill. Mm-hmm. And we could also utilize this every single evening when we shut the park down. Yep. You know, if we have a vehicle that's left in the park and we can't locate the owners, instead of either A locking the vehicle inside of the park and now they can't escape once they find you know once they come back to their vehicle or b leaving it unlocked and now not having the park secure neither one of those are good options Mm -hmm. but if we had you know an outbound only with some spikes they could get out and nobody else could come in unless they went over the spike strips which they which they do, but most people don't. Uh, <laughs> but they can be defeated. If you, uh, I mean, that sounds like a viable solution to me. Yeah. And the, the, <laughs> the third thing on top of all of that is to have a towing company to tow any violators that right. decide they're going to park in the right of way. Because now, you know, if you have these traffic control barriers, you've got your no parking signs, you've got your red you know, stripe along the side of the road. You got your yellow line down the middle of the road. If Mm -hmm. people park anywhere but a designated parking spot, you know, they're in the right of way. Right. And if we could get a towing company to haul them out, you know, word would travel pretty fast. Yes, it would. This is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Don't come here to day use. If you want to come here to day use, you better get here early before anybody else does because once the park fills up, that's it. Yeah. It would get the park back to what it was originally designed for right and i've i've there's like there's an overlook area that's covered by trees where there's benches and since i've been here i i've not seen anybody actually using the overlook area at all (laughs) they're all down they're all down along the water there's a little beach area and the the uh the little limestone tabletop area where they can set up chairs and sit and hang out but nobody's actually using the park for what it's designed for (laughs) so in addition to the parking and, you know, very restricted 
uh, roadways and dangerous roadway that we have in here when the park gets too full. We also have issues with you know littering. Mm-hmm. Um, we have issues with restrooms. You know, not enough of them. We have issues with dumpsters and having to pay for extra dumpsters in here to handle all of the extra trash that's been generated. You guys can't, I mean, you, you've said plenty of times that you don't have the personnel to, to manage the issues that you just talked about. So you've had to partner with another organization just to be able to keep up with the amount of trash and, and the, the porta johns and everything like that. Correct. So the Water Oriented Recreation District of Comal County, word, they are paying for our shoreline cleanup in this park. And that has averaged anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000 a week. I think it's right around $3,500 now that it's starting to slow down a little bit. But still, $3,500 a week. To clean up other people's messes. To clean up the mess from our public. Absolutely. And that's, that's a, a dollar amount that the Corps of Engineers certainly can't afford. You know, we're already paying extra money for restroom cleanings for... Uh, porta potties for dumpsters. I'm looking at it right here. We've got, um, you know, three porta potties, three regular porta potties, one handicap porta potty. You know, that's uh, $4,530. Yes, over the course of the summertime, right there, just for extra porta potties. And then the dumpsters, we have three extra dumpsters in this park and that's another $3,800 so the total is $8,300 for the you know for the course of the summer in addition to the $3,500 to $4,000 a week that word is have a week that word is having to to pay and that's not counting our labor because it takes at least two people to adequately shut down this park Mm -hmm. that's either two park rangers one park ranger and one sheriff's deputy you know, whatever the combination may be, you know, that's labor that we are now not able to utilize on shoreline encroachments or on promoting water safety or on enforcing Title 36 or just maintaining a visual presence elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of our very precious, our most precious resource, and that's our labor that's dedicated just to shutting this park down. Yeah, that just... Just not picking up your trash has a massive ripple effect to other aspects of natural resource management. It's it's unacceptable. <laughs> certainly, certainly. You saw it firsthand. I did. You, you were offended. I did. I, I was. Yes. <laughs> I, I was walking down there. Well, one, I had jeans and a long sleeve shirt and steel toe boots on hiking through limestone trails. So that was one thing. <laughs> but then, yeah, to see these uh, just trash stuffed in every single crevice, every place that trash could be stuffed, there was. And then all the trash bins were full. And I, I don't know if you said it yet, but this park, uh, there's no alcohol allowed at this park. <laughs> every single every single recreator down there was drinking. Probably some underage drinking going on as well. And they're leaving all their empty uh, beer cans or, or liquor bottles down there. And you even provide uh, mesh garbage bags that you can pick up before you walk down to the water line, they're right there. Anybody can grab it just so you can take your trash. And you don't even have to take it home with you. Just bring it back up to the parking area and throw it in the dumpster. Correct. <laughs> it's I, it, As an onlooker, I mean, I'm a recreator as well. And I like to think I practice responsible recreation. But even as an onlooker, it's very easy to see simple steps that the public can make in order to completely turn around the park, like completely turn it around. Because if you're free to do other things that you should be doing rather than, you know, writing tickets for somebody that's throwing trash in the wrong area or two rangers dedicated just to closing a park, you could be doing so many other things to improve everything about the lake. Correct. (laughs) Correct. And so you see... Sorry about my little tangent there. (laughs) You see the domino effect. Mm -hmm. Like once one domino falls, everything else you know, starts following suit. Yep. And Overlook Park is just one example. You know, we're, we're having issues at Canyon Park Swim Beach. You know, um, they're crowding the road like the park is filling up and we don't have traffic control barriers in place to prevent them from parking all over the place. And so they, 
They park all over the main road and they prevent traffic from going down to the Canyon Lake Marina, you know, and that's, you know, causing a uh, hurt to their, to their business is negative imp- negatively impacting their business. Mm-hmm. And we're having the same, you know, litter issues out there at Canyon Park Swim Beach. Uh, every single boat ramp around here, you know, there, there's no way that we can control the crowds at the boat ramps because we're stuck directing traffic at Overlook Park or at Canyon Park Swim Beach. And so a lot of these residents that have properties just outside of these boat ramp areas, now they can't get into or out of their houses because they've got, you know, boats and trailers parked across their driveway. And so imagine not being able to leave your house or get back to your house because your driveway is blocked. <laughs> I mean, how inconvenient is that? Yeah, and, it's and more than inconvenient. <laughs> so our phones, you know, during the business hours, it's not like we get a break during the, the weekday. It's not like it's any slower. That's when all the complaints come in mm-hmm. and our phone rings off the hook. And this is all interrelated to one another. And let's be clear, it's not just Canyon Lake. That's true. Right. I'm sure that... Any other core project can understand the predicament that we're in, yep. and not even the other core projects. I'm sure it's Texas you, Parks and Wildlife, other parks, yeah. exactly. Yeah, state parks, national parks. Yeah, it's not that we don't want people to come out here and have fun. That's that's we want that, right? Like Correct. we want we want people to come out here and enjoy the natural resources. That's if it's not flooding. That's that's what's going on. Natural resources, recreation, and we want people to enjoy it. But if people continue to uh, abuse it, then I mean, it's not going to be around. Correct. It's not going to be available if they continue to do it the wrong way. You know, just talking about the overcrowding issues that that was something that I really wanted to drive home on this podcast. You know, I think what we're doing right now. Hopefully, we'll have an impact. You know, hopefully, it'll be picked up and listened to by those people that can make a difference. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're doing what we can right now by at least bringing attention to what's going on. Well, it's been it's definitely been my honor and privilege to be down in Canyon for the past few days. I've really enjoyed it, and we enjoyed uh, having you. Thank you, I appreciate it. But I think that's going to do it for us here at Canyon Lake. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Fort Worth. Also on Twitter at twitter.com slash underscore Fort Worth. Instagram at Fort Worth. And you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Facebook, and YouTube. Until next time, I'm Trevor Welsh here with Ranger Anderson. And you have just learned why life is better at Canyon Lake. See you next time.